Travelling around the world isn't quite the great feat it was back in the day Captain Cook set sail from Plymouth. But even he might have thought twice before attempting what Jason Lewis from Dorset has been up to. For the past 13 years, Jason's been on an incredible mission. To go around the globe using human power alone. Land ahoy! <laughs> Apparently one person dies in Tibet every year from altitude sickness, and I don't want it to be me. 46,000 miles of the unknown, where exhaustion and danger are part of the daily routine. This is Jason's amazing journey. I was drawn by the, the prospect of adventure. At 24 years old, um, I think uh, a lot of people have that uh, desire to go and cut their teeth on new challenges and, and test yourself and find out who you really are. It's 1994. Fed up with window cleaning, Jason and his friend Steve Smith set themselves a staggering challenge to complete a human-powered trek around the planet. That means no engines and no sails. Moksha, their boat, is basically a pimped-up pedalo. It's not as safe as sailing or going across a motorboat, but I'd rather, um, I'd rather do this across the Atlantic and the Pacific, and, OK, if I, if I die, then I'd die, but I'd rather have done this than get to 75 years old and not having done it and just led a mediocre life. They set out from Greenwich. Full of optimism, they plan to complete the trip in just two years. It's going to be a good expedition. We were incredibly unfit. And I remember the first day riding out from Greenwich in July 1994. And apart from getting lost on the, around the South Circular, I also remember this, this whole thing of biking was just a real chore. And after about 20 miles thinking, God, am I really going to be able to make it around the planet? I can hardly get past, you know, Streatham. After six weeks, they arrive in Lagos, Portugal. And from here, they launch Moksha into the Atlantic. There was a real peace, a sense of peace of being on this wide open ocean. Um, there was a, there was a realization, I think, that um, really what's most important for me, at least, was was not to worry about something in the future, but immerse my attention on the present and just worry about what's happening right here, right now. Man overboard! After 111 days, they make it to Miami. Next stop, the West Coast. If you're going to San Francisco, this is America, so how else to get there but on rollerblades? It's all about technique going up here on skates. If you get the right Technique, it's actually not that hard at all. Unfortunately, I haven't got the technique. You're gonna meet some gentle people there. But it's not eight rolling wheels that hold Jason up, but four. <laughs> Jason's been hit by a drunk driver on a dual carriageway in Colorado. Both of his legs are badly broken. I was hit by a car um, from behind at 40 miles an hour. I think it must have been my left leg that was behind when the car struck, and it basically hit, hit my legs just below the knee and um, threw me onto the windscreen. My rucksack, luckily, was on my back and shielded my spine from getting shattered, because then I probably would have been killed. <laughs> I think at that time I could have said, you know, I've been on this a year and I'm sitting here with two broken legs. It's too much of a price to pay. 
you know, time to go home. Jason's recovery is slow and frustrating. I've been here for four days already and uh, it already feels like a lifetime. For whatever reason, I decided that I wanted to continue and that whatever comes along after this, short of being killed, is going to be nothing compared to getting over these two broken legs. <laughs> Finally, three years after reaching America, Jason and Steve are in San Francisco. It's September 1998 when they again launch Moksha for their toughest challenge yet, the Pacific. It's an unforgiving ocean. They've got to stay on their guard. Whoa. <laughs> Huge. <laughs> it's like a big lion. God. That is one very good reason why I will not be <laughs> swimming <laughs> in the water big today. That is a big shark. The expedition's now four years in. Steve is starting to feel the strain. <laughs> After 54 days pedaling, they arrive in Hawaii. <laughs> But Steve's had enough. He pulls out and heads home. Jason has to face the Pacific alone. When the support boat turned around, went back to Hawaii, and there was suddenly this dead silence of the ocean, and I was alone. There was no one there with me. And I had to find this coral atoll 2,400 miles away that's just like a would like a, trying to find a, a needle in a, a, in a haystack, I, it, it suddenly dawned on me that I am so alone and this ocean is so massive and, and, I, and I, yeah, I had a bit of a pang of fear at that point, I think. But loneliness isn't the only new hurdle as Jason enters the doldrums. I would pedal for 15 hours a day against a one and a half half knot current um, make maybe 20 miles good and then wake up in the morning back where I started from. You know, it's alright pedaling on the spot for an hour or two, but after the week, first week, I was like, oh, this is soul destroying. That's where it gets down to the crunch when you realize your limitations as a human powered vehicle. Um, and the ocean is a great teacher of humility, that's for sure. Three weeks later, Jason finally escapes the doldrums. Land ahoy! <laughs> you probably can't see it there in the camera, but, but just on the horizon, there's a tiny little ribbon of black. And that is Tarawa. We made it! The celebrations are short-lived. Jason arrives to find the Solomons in the middle of a military coup. He doesn't hang around. In September 2000, he becomes the first person to ever pedal across the Pacific. But by the time he reaches Australia, the expedition is bankrupt. As Jason and his supporters cycle the 3,000 miles across the continent, the trip is thrown off track by the continual grind of fundraising. It's five years until he's able to move on. First by kayak through Indonesia. Just paddle about 17 miles, and the last thing we need is to be exposed onto a weather shore with a force four wind blowing us onto a coral reef. 
then through Asia to reach Nepal in September 2006. And his next challenge? Scaling the Himalayas. To avoid potentially tricky Chinese police checkpoints, Jason has to take the most difficult route. The problem about these, uh, these passes in Tibet is that you have, to, you have to cycle ending up to 40, 30, 40 miles, but it's essentially about two miles vertically in any one day and then get down again uh, before the evening because uh, if you're caught up there at night, that's when you can catch altitude sickness and it can snow and the weather can be horrible. So there's, there's a big pressure to get up over these mountain passes in one single day. But the weather is so foul up here and it's so cold. It's hailing and snowing and raining and I'm just soaked to the core and I'm just going to get down from off this mountain as quickly as possible. I'm in my tent here at about 4,900 meters. And I'm feeling really rotten. I think I might have come down with um, altitude sickness. It's a little bit scary because I'm on my own. And if uh, my condition deteriorates to the point where I need to get further down the mountain um, tonight, I wouldn't have anyone to help me, um, you know, break down the tent. And, you know, if I get really bad to the point, you know, someone to actually help me get down the mountain, I'd just strap myself to the bob trailer and let myself go. Exhausted, Jason finally gets through. He's now almost 12 years into the trip. I've also taken on a new expedition partner who's going to run with me all the way to Bombay. <laughs> oh, come on, you big wuss. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Good luck. After 10 months pedaling through Asia and Africa, he arrives in Istanbul. So uh, I've just crossed over from Asia, which is behind me, and uh, uh, just rode across the Bosphorus thanks to the uh, Turkish Rowing Federation who lent me one of their traditional kayaks. And I'm now standing on Europe again, so it's just this last home straight back to London from here. And in September 2007, Jason reaches the coast of northern France. Home is tantalizingly close. We really had to scramble to get the boat ready for leaving. I think we had half an hour, and it was coming up to high tide. There were these rocks that were underneath the surface of the water that if we didn't get the boat out quickly enough, and if it was rolled over in the surf, we would have lost the boat. That's going to be a problem even getting it out there, then, isn't it? Really? And so, in a way, there was like 13 years of of the trip were coming to a head on this morning and I, we, you know, we could have lost everything. Are you afraid by rocks in water? Oh, the rocks are here, right? No. Didier, where is there no rocks? Uh, there is a little rocks there. So we have to wait. We have to wait for the moment. The kindness of strangers saves the day. Through the assistance of, of this French family who were just there 
out on a, on a Saturday morning to pick cockles and mussels. They just absolutely rolled up their sleeves. They, they gave us a hand up to their chests in seawater, pushing the boat out through the surf. And we got away with it. And it was one of the most exhilarating parts of the whole expedition. It was a real rush. After a staggering 37 countries and 13 years, Jason's finally come full circle. I've always had this adage that it's about the journey and not the destination, but uh, but when I did cross that line and finally reached the destination, it's it was like all of this, all these emotions and all of the years of just perseverance, I suppose, and, and all the trials and the troubles and the disasters and just suddenly kind of rose up to meet me and it just completely overwhelmed me. What did it feel like, Jason? I'm a little choked up. Overwhelmed. How are you feeling, Jason? Kind of overwhelmed. Oh, I just felt, um, I felt <laughs> 13 years, 13 years coming coming to an end. It's, it's been a big, long journey. It's good to be back. It's been one incredible chunk of my life. And I've, I've been lucky, been very lucky, I think, to, to survive some of the mishaps that have happened and to be able to tell the tales and seeing the South Pacific and coral island atolls and Australia and Indonesia and the Himalayas, I mean, it's, you couldn't buy it for money. Jason's proved that even in this day and age, the world is still a very big place and that there's still adventures to be found for the brave of heart.